Inside, it's comfortable. Inside a house, inside a family, inside a routine. But what if we widen our view beyond the fence across the street? Outside, we find people struggling with loneliness, poverty, families that don't look like ours, or without a safe family at all. Jesus didn't call us to live by our neighbors. He called us to love our neighbors. Well, hey, welcome. So glad you guys are here this morning. Um, week two of our series called Let's Neighbor. Now, last week we started this series looking at what is called the Great Commandment. In fact, Jesus was asked the question, what is the greatest commandment out of all of the commandments? And last week we looked at Mark's account, and today we're going to look at Matthew's account. And we started with this idea last week. This idea that was, we can't neighbor without the loving God. We can't neighbor without the loving God. And today, I want to lean into what is really, I would call probably part two of our introduction to this series. Um, and this thought is really going to kind of drive us today, is, is that we can't love God without loving our neighbor. We can't love God without loving our neighbor. So if you've got your Bibles, open them up to the book of Matthew. We're going to be in a few different places in Matthew today, but uh, we're going to start in chapter 22, verse 35. Now, I told you just a moment ago, last week we looked at Mark's record. Now, Mark is considered um, the earliest account of the story of Jesus. He's the one who records it the earliest out of everybody that records um, out of all four Gospels, he's the earliest. In fact, um, most people say that it was written somewhere around 64 or 65 AD. So within about 30 years of the death of Christ is when the book of Mark was written. Now, Mark was not a um, not privy to most of the life of Jesus. He was there at the very, very end of it. But uh, he was a disciple of Peter. And so most of Mark's account, we think, is actually Peter's story being told. And what's uh, interesting is, is that in 64, 65 AD, um, that's around the same time that Peter was crucified. He was crucified upside down as a martyr for Christ. And so Mark's gospel is a little bit different than the other gospels because Mark's gospel has this sense of urgency behind it. In fact, one of the characteristics that you'll notice in the book of Mark is this. He says, and immediately, over and over and over again, and immediately, and immediately, and immediately. Like, you just can't wait for something to, to just get on to whatever the next thing is that's there. Um, because Mark has this huge sense of urgency to get to the main event, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, some of that may have been because Peter knew that his death was impending. And so he wanted to make sure that he got to that story, the most crucial story out of everything and out of all the time that he spent with Jesus to ensure that the church, which was under immense persecution right now, knew about the hope that they had because of Jesus. And so Peter has this sense of um, urgency to get there. Now Matthew's gospel is a little bit different. Matthew's gospel was written a little bit later. In fact, we think about a decade later, so somewhere around 75 AD. And about the same time that Matthew's gospel shows up is about the same time that Luke shows up. They come about the same time. And Matthew and Luke cause this interesting problem that we call the synoptic problem. Because the three gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke each use each other to build their gospel. And so there are a lot of similarities that exist between their accounts. But they edited each other's gospels. And so you see some things that are different and it causes this problem. In fact, it's a problem sometimes for us because we go, well, did they edit it because something was wrong? And so therefore we would have an inerrancy or we'd have an error that exists in the Bible, but we would say, no, we believe that the Bible is inerrant or without error. So how could this exist that they edited the accounts of what somebody else said? 
Well, some of the editing that goes on is for some specific purposes, and sometimes it highlights some really important things that the authors wanted their audiences to know. The audiences of both of these books was very, very different. Mark's audience was written to a church that was being persecuted at the time. And so he was very quickly, uh, and without a lot of other teaching and storying going along the way, getting to the main point of the death of Jesus and the resurrection that happened. Matthew, on the other hand, was not written to a primarily Gentile audience. It was written to a very Jewish audience. And because of that, there are some things that Mark wrote that Matthew edited out because his audience would know and understand these things because they were Jewish. They were Hebrew by nature. They had been raised that way. Um, they knew these things. In fact, one of them that we're going to see we made a big deal about last week, and that is that Jesus, when he began the greatest commandment, began at Deuteronomy 6, 4 with, Hear, O Israel, and Matthew has completely dropped that out. And the reason that happens is that Matthew's audience was a Jewish, a Hebrew audience that he was writing to. And so because of that, they knew and assumed that that was already part of this great commandment and statement. They didn't need the extra words there for them to put all of that together. Now, as we look at this, we're going to see a lot of different things between the two accounts, but I think that they highlight some important things for us, and they're really going to showcase this idea that we cannot love God without first loving our neighbors. So let's read together Matthew's account starting in verse 35. It says this, it says, in one of them, a lawyer asked him a question to test him. He said, teacher, what is, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And then he said, a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Let's pray. God, I pray this morning for us that as we um, work through and, and wrestle with this text, Father, that we would um, see your divine inspiration. That we would see the, the, the truths that Matthew was working so diligently to communicate to his audience. And God, even though we weren't his original intended audience, may we see some of those same things because they still ring true for us today. And God, more importantly than anything, may, may we not just hear these things and walk out and go, oh, that was good to hear. But God, would we be transformed and may we take steps towards you as a result of the things that you share with us today that we just give you all of the glory and the honor and it's in your son's precious and holy name i pray amen so matthew has edited a lot in this text right one of the first things that we see that is different in this text is who it is that is doing the speaking to Jesus. Mark records that it was a scribe, a third group of people who comes to Jesus in a series of questions that were designed to show that he was not the Messiah. You had the Pharisees who'd failed, you had the Sadducees who'd failed, and a scribe who saw the great answers that were going comes and approaches Jesus and says, hey, I want to know the answer to this. Matthew, on the other hand, says that this lawyer, a Pharisee, comes to ask the question, and he uses the word, test him. To test him. Now, I'm not a teacher, all right? But as a student, I can tell you that when a test was given, it was never a very positive thing in my world, all right? And I was a good test taker. But test was never, you know, you walk into class that day and they're like, hey, we're going to pop test today, pop quiz. I was never like, woohoo, what a great thing that is. <laughs> never. Right? Hey, thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah. And so here it is. Jesus is going to be given a test. Now, this word test is a very interesting word. In fact, earlier, earlier, Jesus has quoted to Satan. He said, do not test the Lord your God. Right? Same word that's used here. And Jesus is quoting when he gives that, that phrase back to Satan. At the moment that he's been spending in the wilderness for 40 days, and he's being tempted to disobey all the things that God has given to him and to follow whatever tempting thing it is that Satan has given to him. He says, no, look, it is written, do not test the Lord your God. And that quote comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. Now, if you've been with us for, for the first part of the fall, we did a series called Baggage, where we walked through the story of the Israelites and their exodus. And they came to a place called Mara. And Mara was a pit stop on their journey. In fact, the Israelites were, they were thirsty. And so they began to look for how to satisfy their thirst. And so as they were journeying on their way, they found Mara. And Mara had some water that was there. And so they stopped and began to drink from the water and found that it was bitter. And they cried out to God and said, God, why do you do this to us? Why can't you take care of us? We just don't understand. Of course, we fast forward to the end of the story. We find out that just a half a day's journey further, had they finished the journey that God had for them, that there was an amazing place, an oasis filled with all kinds of palm trees and all kinds of different springs that would have met all of their needs and then some, but they had chose to stop short of what God had called them to do. Nowhere in the passage did it say that God said for them to stop at Mara. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 6, after they've been given the Ten Commandments, God reminds them, he says, do not test me like you did at Mara. Listen, any time that we fall short of what God's plan is for our lives, that is called sin. And when we ask God to bless our sin, he says, don't test me like that. Don't test me like that. And so Jesus quotes that back to Satan. And so here we have a lawyer who gives a test to Jesus. And so Jesus responds, and I find all kinds of irony in this. It would be ironic if Jesus just quoted from the book of Deuteronomy, which contains this same passage. But here's what Jesus does. Jesus says the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. You just back up 10 verses from where Jesus had quoted about testing in 6.16 to 6.5, and you find this verse. Ooh, I think there's some great irony in that. Jesus is quoting from the same exact location where it says, do not test the Lord your God. And so he answers this guy, this lawyer, with this passage. Now, again, we see that Matthew has edited from what Mark has said. If you were here last week, you noticed that Mark gave us four things that we were supposed to love the Lord our God with. We we're supposed to love the Lord our God with our mind. We we're supposed to love him with our heart. We we're supposed to love him with our soul. And Mark also said that we were supposed to love him with all of our strength. But Matthew doesn't have that one here. So what happened? Did Jesus not say it? I mean, personally, I'm not really sure you're supposed to love something with all your strength. I mean, is that like a big bear hug that you're supposed to give to it? I'm not really sure what loving something with all of your strength is really supposed to be. But here's the thing. Matthew's audience was very, very different than Mark's audience. And so Matthew's audience paid attention to things like numbers. And so three is the number of God. It represented who God is to all of the Hebrews. And so something that was described about loving God in a three would have rang more true to them than something about loving God in a four. 
And so he chooses to highlight this and to give them a completeness behind it with this idea of three. And so we have this recording from him that says, with all of these things. He also skips out on the hero Israel. But we've already talked about the fact that Matthew's audience was primarily Jewish or Hebrew. And so they would have known that because the Shema was for them. And something that they would have practiced all the time. Finally, Matthew has this other major thing that shows up. That Mark doesn't say or record. Mark kind of sandwiches together the two commandments. And in fact, we said it almost seems like in Mark that they are joined together as one new commandment from two different places in Scripture. But here Matthew, Matthew stops after the love of the Lord your God, and he says, this is the great and foremost commandment. Jesus didn't have to say that. Jesus did not have to qualify that this was the great and this was the foremost commandment to love God with everything that you have. But he did. And then in classic Jesus fashion, he doesn't stop. He elevated the teaching. Because then he says, then he says, the second is like it. Whoa, time out. So the guy asks for what is the greatest commandment. Jesus answers. He says, here's the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your, your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. That's the great commandment. But then he says, there's a second great commandment. Wait, what? He says, there's a second great commandment. He says, this commandment is like the first one. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, how in the world could this second commandment be like the first commandment? What is Jesus communicating here when he says that the second one is like the first one? The first one makes sense to us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your, your soul, right? That's the this first one. That's the one that Matthew has just communicated, that Jesus has just recorded down, that's there Love the Lord. How in the world can loving your neighbor be like that? If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Our love for God is fully filled when we love our neighbor. Our love for God is fully filled when we love our neighbor. Now, last week we did um, what I would call a failed illustration. When I got home, my wife said, oh, that was so great. I thought you were just trying not to make a mess up there, right? But we had these two cups of water, right? They were up here. And we talked about how when most of us come to church, we don't come with a cup that is um, all the way full, half full. In fact, most of us, we come to church with a cup that is probably barely has any water in it. We've drained out all of the living water that is inside of us throughout the course of the week as we face whatever the circumstances are that are a part of our week. And as we talked last week, we said, look, because God is one, he is the unified God, there is no division among him. He is the one who exists in perfect relationship and invites us into perfect relationship. We should love. And we can love because God is love. That was all last week. And we said that really what we should do is, is that when we get to church, we should already be all the way filled up with God when we walk in the door. So that when God and the Spirit begins to pour out, I, my, I've seen my wife's coming all nervous about making a mess up here now. <laughs> but as God begins to pour out to us, it begins to overflow. <laughs> I give up. It's good. It'll work for a third week next week. We had two weeks of failed illustrations. I don't know. They were both, you guys saw it. They were three quarters full. I don't know. 
Oh, oh, there it is. Thank you. Thank you, God. I appreciate that, man. Listen, most of you are probably like me. You heard that and you said, you know what? He's right. If, I, if I'm honest about myself, I probably come into church looking more like this glass, mostly empty, and say, all right, fill me up so I can go out and, and, and enjoy my week. And I don't allow for um, this overflow to happen inside of my life because I don't come in filled up. And here's what happens is we go home and we say, you know what? Here's how I get more filled up with God. I'll read my Bible more. Right? I'll spend more time reading my Bible. I'll pray more. Right? I'll, that'll bring me closer to God and I'll have more relationship with Him and that will fill me up more. Those are good things, right? Those are good deeds that we're supposed to do. And surely those are things that God wants us to do to be filled up with Him. You know what's interesting is, is that Matthew's use of this phrase of, of loving your neighbor as yourself, this is not the first time that this commandment has shown up in Matthew. It's actually the third exact time that it's shown up in this exact verbiage, and it's been mentioned and linked to at least three other times in the book of Matthew. And most recently, most recently, it comes from an account that's just back in Matthew chapter 19. Let me read to you this account. It says, Behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? What good deed must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? He said, there's only one who's good. But he continues on, right? I mean, he's pretty much answered the guy's question at this moment right here about there's nothing good that you could possibly do in order to get eternal life. He could have stopped and just walked away and this guy probably would have been confounded about everything that was about that had just taken place. But Jesus humors him and humors us to give us some more insight about what's going on. And he says, all right, fine. If you would like to enter into life, Keep the commandments. Keep the commandments. And so the man is like us, right? He wants to know which ones. Jesus, there's 613 of them. Surely you don't mean all 613 of them. I've got you. You surely have the answer key about how it is that I'm supposed to do this. So which ones do you want me to keep? Jesus looked at him and said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal shall not bear false witness, honor your, brother, your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man, almost in a fashion of interrupting him, says, all of these I've kept, what do I still lack? Now sometimes this is where I wish I could see like facial expressions of Jesus, right? <laughs> Like, I kind of think this is like the eye roll moment from Jesus. Like, <laughs> like, you have not kept these things. I promise you haven't done it. And Jesus said to him, fine, I'm going to tell you what it is that you lack. He says, if you would be perfect, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. Now, this young man is commonly referred to as the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler, he comes to Jesus seeking eternal life. He asks him, what good deed do I have to do in order to be filled up that I might be overflowing? What good can I do in all of this stuff? And Jesus begins to go through the commandments after he's really said, there's, you, you can't be good enough to get into eternal life. <laughs> but here's what it was that the man was missing. He didn't really love his neighbor. 
When Jesus challenged him about if he was loving his neighbor, he says to him, he says, go sell all of your possessions and give to the poor. Who was his neighbor? It was the poor that were all around him. And he says, the man walked away sad because he couldn't do that. Paul wrote to the church in Rome, and he says this in Romans 13. Illustrates the same idea. He says, 13 verses 8 through 10, he says, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal. Sound familiar? He said, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Look, Jesus' response, Paul's response is the exact same in that it is that we lack love. In fact, you cannot, I mean, it almost just brings us full circle, right? We cannot love God without loving our neighbor. And we cannot love our neighbor without loving God. They go hand in hand. I read several different people this week that made the case that loving my neighbor was loving God because my neighbor was the physical representation of the image of who God is. And I, I, I think that there's a, a lot of truth in that, but that's not what Jesus said at the end of this passage. It's not what Jesus said about why it is that we should love our neighbor and that we should love God. He doesn't say because they are the physical representation, they are the image bearers of, of God, and so because of that, you should love them, and then doing so, you're loving God. He doesn't say that. What he does say is he says on the two commandments, on these two commandments, depend the entirety of the law and the prophets. John Piper gave an illustration about this. I love how he described it. He said, if we could understand that the, the entirety of scripture, the law and the prophets was all a gigantic scroll. And that that scroll had been uh, unwound and pulled open across all of time and, and history and the time-space continuum. He said, if we could see that. And he said that in the midst of that, Jesus comes and he plucks us out of the, the scroll, out of the story, out of the script, and gives us an opportunity to back up and away and above all of this. He says, and as we begin to see this scroll, which is stretched throughout all of eternity, which is writing the story of God's redemptive history for us. He said, what we begin to notice is that there are some chains at either extreme end of the scroll. Some chains that are binding open the scroll so that the story could play out. And he said, Jesus then gives us the opportunity to trace these two chains that are on the ends and that are going up into the heavens and we get to go back to the source of where these chains are at and what we find is is that these chains are attached to either side of the throne of God on one side it says on the right love God with all of your heart mind and soul and on the other side it says love your neighbor as yourself and what we find is is that the entirety of the scroll has been pinned from the throne of God and hangs on these two ideas in fact I love this quote he says the whole scroll the law and the prophets the whole history of redemption and all of my father's plans and acts hang on these two great sovereign purposes of God. That he be loved by his people and that his people love each other. I, 
don't believe that it would be too much to say here that all of creation and all of redemption, all of history, hang on these two great purposes. Matthew 22, 40 gives us the origin. Romans 13, 8 gives us the goal, right, of the law and the prophets. It is to love God and to love people. It's the beginning and the end of why God inspired the entire Bible. Now, last week I, I shared a question that I came across from an author named Rick Rousse, and it's in his book called The Neighboring Church. And in his book he said, would my neighbor miss me? As a question. We asked that question in here, and several of you talked with me about that, and how impactful of a thought that was. And let me tell you, it, I struggled with that question all week long because there were moments where I know that my neighbors would not have missed me in some of the things that I did or did not do this week. But this week, I want to leave you with a, a second question to kind of add to that. Now, some of you know who Eugene Peterson uh, was. Eugene Peterson was the author of the Message Bible. Now, the Message Bible is, is different because it's a thought for thought instead of a word-for-word -word translation. And so we don't typically preach from the Message, although we'll share some insights from it. Um, now, Eugene pa Eugene Peterson um, passed away about a week and a half ago. I don't know if everybody knows that or not. But at 85, he just passed away. But he wrote this. John 1, 14, he said, The word became flesh and blood, and it moved into the neighborhood. It moved into the neighborhood. And he said, We saw the glory of our, with our own eyes, the one-of-a-kind glory like the Father, like Son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. I love that. God moved into the neighborhood. You know, there are times like this week where we face some sort of a trouble, something that is so big and so great that we just want to know that God is next door, that he's close, that he's near. When our trouble comes, we want to be able to run to him and say, God, thank you for being near to us. But here's the question that I have. Has the word moved into your neighborhood? Has God, what would happen if God moved into your neighborhood? What would he say? What would he do? And I just want to leave us with that thought. What would happen if? Now next week we're gonna tackle what I think is probably the biggest question of this entire series. And that is the question of who is my neighbor? Charles, we've talked for two weeks about the importance of neighboring. We've talked for two weeks about the idea that we couldn't do it without the loving God who because of who he is allows us to do it. But now you've now told us that we can't even really love God without loving our neighbor. We can't love our neighbor without loving God. Those two things are interchangeable together. So who is my neighbor? Come back next week because we're going to talk about all about that. Let me pray for us. God, I thank you. I thank you that you sent Jesus to move into the neighborhood. God, this whole world is your big giant neighborhood. And you sent him straight down here to live next door. So that you would be accessible to us and close to us. And God, that we could come into relationship with you. God, I pray that you would help us because those are some big questions about if our neighbors would miss us if we moved out. What kind of relationship do we have with them? And God, about whether or not you're on display inside of our neighborhood, whether or not 
you're existing there inside of our neighborhoods. And God, what would happen if you were there? And I know in an omnipresent sense, the, the fact that you are everywhere all the time, God, you are inside of our neighborhoods, but I think often we don't work to make you known. Pray that that question would challenge us this week as we walk out the doors. That God, we would take on those two questions of engaging with those who are neighbors to us in, in such a way as to make you known. I just continue to give you all of the glory and the honor in your name.